Okay, hopefully you've watched the, the squid video already showing you how scientists first uh, prepared the squid giant axon in order to record action potentials and figure out the mechanism of the action potential. In this laboratory exercise you're going to do, we're uh, going to be simulating what they did. Instead of having to catch a squid and cut it up and pull out the giant axon and, you know, clear off all the tiny little axons from it, we have equations that have been derived that predict what the squid giant axon will do, uh, and really what most neurons will do. Okay, first you should read through the first page carefully. There are a lot of terms here. Some of them you're already familiar with, but it, it helps to review. Some of them you're not familiar with, but you're going to need to refer back to this. These terms are going to be mentioned during the lab, and you're going to need to fill in these terms sometimes. This is the preparation that we're simulating. You've got an electrode inside the neuron. You've got another electrode outside the neuron, not shown. And you're recording the difference in charge across the membrane. In other words, the voltage across the membrane, also called the membrane potential. Also, you've got another electrode inside the axon elsewhere where you're stimulating, you're injecting current, either positive or negative in different amplitudes and different durations, but you're injecting current, you're zapping the axon, and then you're going to see what kind of changes in the membrane potential that produces. So you want to go to this website and you'll pull up something like this. First step is to click on membrane action potential. By the way, everything I'm showing you here is also explained uh, in the instructions on the packet. Press the EX button a couple of times, I'd say three times. That just increases the scale of this red uh, graph right here. Then you click stimulus and variables to plot. So this red line is showing you the artificial stimulation that was injected into the axon. The black line is showing you the change in voltage across the membrane. So this is the cell's membrane potential, the difference in charge across the membrane, as it changes over time, in this case over 10 milliseconds, 10 thousandths of a second. And on the y-axis, you've got voltage measured in millivolts. And you can see we've got an action potential here. We started out at negative 60. For mammals, it's closer to negative 70. For invertebrates, like the squid, it's closer to negative 60 or 65. So you start at the resting potential here. This stimulation that you introduced, this current you introduced, created an, uh, a depolarization of the membrane here. So it got closer to zero, less negative. You depolarize the neuron, because remember at rest, it's polarized. You must have hit the threshold because you initiated an action potential. If this was a little bit smaller, if you had used less current, you might not have hit the threshold, and you just would have gone back to the resting potential. You would have just depolarized the cell a little bit without hitting the threshold. But here you hit the threshold, you elicited an action potential. You want to click these two buttons, or these two check boxes, to show the sodium conductance in green and potassium conductance in blue. This is showing you how easily sodium ions are being conducted through the membrane, how easily they can pass through the membrane. This is showing you how easily potassium ions can pass through the membrane, and it's showing you how these things change over time. Really, you can think of these as being the percentage of sodium channels that are open and the percentage of potassium channels that are open because that's the only way these ions can be conducted through the membrane. So here, right about here, you can see the sodium channels start opening up rapidly, and then they close. You can see that the potassium channels open up very slowly, and then close very, very slowly. It's the movement of these ions that's driving the action potential. I'm going to put a little line here at the the peak of the action potential. You can do this too. So that shows you the peak of the action potential. So this is the rising phase, and hopefully you remember what's producing this change in voltage here, this rapid depolarization, is sodium ions. 
at the threshold, the sodium channels open, the voltage-gated sodium channels open, and sodium rushes in. Here you can see the voltage-gated sodium channels opening. Sodium is rushing through those open channels into the, the axon, which makes the inside more and more and more positive. By the time you get to the peak, pretty much all the sodium that wants to rush in is already rushed in. But at about the peak, you can see, you now start seeing an increase in potassium conductance. So during the falling phase of the action potential, potassium channels are opening. And hopefully you remember that the potassium wants to flow out. At the peak of the action potential, there's lots of potassium on the inside, and now the inside is positive, just like the potassium ions. So those potassium ions flow out through the open potassium channels as they open. As they leave the neuron, they carry their positive charge with them and make the inside of the neuron more and more and more negative. Those channels stay open a long time. This is the relative refractory period. Out here is the relative refractory period. The absolute refractory period is really just the falling phase here. During the relative refractory period, you can have an action potential. The voltage-gated sodium channels will open, but it's much harder to get the threshold, in part because the cell is hyperpolarized. This is that undershoot that we saw. It's hyperpolarized because the, the voltage-gated potassium channels are still open, and potassium is, just keeps leaking and leaking and leaking out of the cell. But as those channels close, less and less potassium is leaking out of the cell, and so the voltage gets closer and closer and closer to the resting potential. Over here, this is how you adjust the stimuli, the red line. So the red line is showing you how long and how much you zapped the axon. This is where you adjust that. So for example, I'm going to change this to uh, 4 milliseconds and 0.2, I'm sorry, 4 microamps, that's the amplitude of the, the current you're stimulating with, and then change the duration to 0.2 milliseconds. These other two pulses are both set to zero amplitude, so nothing's happening. You're not sending in any current there. Even though you've set a duration, it doesn't do anything. You can see that you've stimulated less right here, but it still had a result. The inside of the neuron went closer to zero, and then when you stopped stimulating, it went back eventually to the resting potential. It took about five milliseconds there before it got more or less back to the resting potential. So here you've depolarized the neuron. If this happened as a result of synaptic input, it would be an EPSP, an excitatory postsynaptic potential. If it went the other way, if you injected negative current, you would hyperpolarize the cell. If that happens as a result of synaptic input, it would be an IPSP, or inhibitory postsynaptic potential. Be very careful when you're entering in these numbers so that you put them in exactly as it says in the packet. And don't hesitate to email me or come by office hours uh, or give me a phone call if you run into problems. Good luck.